Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, would you like to try sharing your slides? Yeah, I'm going to do that right now. Okay. One second. works uh yes i do see on the right side the oh i can get rid of that yeah i see um, what do i do uh... there we go that looks perfect okay great so um usually with me things go tech technologically bad at some point so be sure to interrupt me rather than just letting me if something goes wrong don't let me oh, talk into nowhere no problem we'll, we'll let you know if there's any issues okay so we start around 10 30 four minutes or yeah yeah 10 30 okay. I'll, I'll give you a brief introduction and then uh the floor okay. will be yours and 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 what's how long and et cetera et cetera do you want me to yeah, uh, so, so I think we, we need to cut it off at 1130. Um, if we could end a little early to have some time for questions, that would be great. But okay. um, that, that's all and, to you. Okay. If I'm just curious, if I'm a little late, um, could, I'm willing to stay on and take questions, or do you have to turn this off at 1130? Um, I, I think we could stay a little long, but uh, we like to try to keep to the schedule because some people have class or other commitments. Oh, okay. Well, I'll, okay. Um, I'll try to keep track of time. I always have too much, but I'll end <laughs> when I end. Um, yeah, I okay. can give you uh, maybe a heads up when there's like about five minutes left or something like that. Why don't you do it at 10 minutes? 10 minutes? Because sure. I have different sections. I might jump to a different section if I'm behind. Okay. Yeah, I can do that. Perfect. Okay, great. So I'll be right back and ready to go. Okay. Okay, I think it's about time to get started. Uh, so hello everyone, welcome back to the third week of the Distinguished Theme Seminar Series on Causal Inference. Uh, before we start the seminar, if you're watching on Zoom, please keep your microphone muted at all times, unless you're asking a question, 
If you're watching live on YouTube, you can write your questions in the YouTube chat and we will forward them to the speaker. Uh, today, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor James Robbins. Uh, Professor Robbins is best known for his work on developing methods to perform causal inference from complex observational or randomized studies, uh, particularly in those where the treatments vary with time. He's the 2013 recipient of the Nathan Mantle Award for Lifetime Achievement in Statistics and Epidemiology. And currently, Professor Robbins is the Mitchell and Robin LaFoley Dong Professor of Epidemiology at the Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, we're honored to have Professor Robbins with us today, and he'll be talking about uh, single world intervention graphs. Uh, at this point, let's all give Professor Robbins our full attention. You're, you're mute. James, you're, you're mute. Jim? Yes, you're still muted, uh, Professor Robbins. Uh, Jordan, can, could you unmute him? Uh, I, I sent him a request to unmute but I think he has to do it himself. Okay, okay. that should do we it. Go. Can me? Yeah. Okay. okay, we can hear you now, perfect. Excellent, good. Okay, all right. Um, well, thanks very much for inviting me. And um, I realize the audience is very mixed. Some people who know about a lot about causal inference and um, some who don't. And because of that, I'm going to, uh, not have many equations, but I'm going to cover a lot. And for people who don't know anything, um, I'm not going to explain everything totally. But if you just then look at the slides later, um, it'll give you, you'll be able to go back and fill in what you don't know. But that way I won't bore the people who um, know a lot too much. OK, so I'm starting. Um, so we're in um, the midst of a causal revolution. As uh, 40 years ago, uh, different um, disciplines had their own language and ways of talking about causal inference, uh, lots of disciplines, which I have up there, um, you can read. Um, and today, all these disciplines have a common language. And as such, each learns rapidly from each other. Actually, there are two apparent languages, causal graphs, which are historically been used more in philosophy, computer science, and sociology, and counterfactual models, which have historically been used in economic statistics. But they really are one because the uh, identical underlying counterfactual model, um, that is a counterfactual causal model uh, called a, a finest causal interpreted structured tree graph by me because it was long ago and I didn't know about the importance of acronyms. And later a non-parametric structural equation model by Perl is the same model. Um, uh, and so we, uh, so underlying the graphical models is the same counterfactual model, as a counterfactual model. And um, uh, to be able to communicate between people uh, raised on um, counterfactual, counterfactuals and those raised on causal graphs. Um, Thomas Richardson and I have um, devised these graphs called SWIGs, which stands for Single World Intervention Graphs, that allow um, the two groups to um, translate among themselves so everybody can speak a common language. I'll show you later an example of those. Um, of SWIG. So, um, so now that everybody's talking the same language, new methodologies can cross fertilize. So let's consider epidemiology and medicine. So those are the two fields I'm in. Well, now in analyzing a single observational data set, with ask, people ask different causal questions. And in the same analysis, uh, in analyzing the data set, they may do a causal mediation analysis, which um, 
has its origins in psychology and sociology. They may do an instrumental variable analysis, which has its origins in economics. They may do a marginal structural model fit with double and multiply robust estimators that has its, organ, its uh, origin in epidemiology and biostatistics. So you can see even in, uh, they really have merged the, all the disciplines. Also, we've gone from a handful of researchers when I started in 19, the early 1980s to perhaps, I have no idea, but thousands of people who work on causal inference, um, both theoretically and uh, applied. It's a hot topic in almost every one of those disciplines before no one went into it. Now, causal inference is getting the best grad students. And as a consequence, the rate of newly recognized problems and new methods to solve them are exploding. And uh, some of the hot things now, um, which if I have time, I'll get to more in the end, are something called interference. Does somebody else's treatment affect my outcome? Unmeasured confounding. What do I do if I didn't measure all the common causes of exposure and the outcome? What am I going to do? So, because causation is not association, uh, when there's unmeasured confounding, um, how am I going to deal with that? And then there's the issue of discovery of causal structures, um, which means, you know, I have like, um, I don't know what's causing what, some very complicated system, but I have data on it. How do I learn from the, to go from the data associations to drawing causal conclusions? And uh, there have been some interesting new proposals about using methods based on causal invariance across heterogeneous environments. And now in the archive, at least for me, there are too many papers to keep up. So how did this rapid uh, development and merging happen? Well, um, here are what I think are the main uh, reasons. Um, there's been an end of suppression of causal language based on observational data and statistics in medicine. So you were historically not allowed to use the word causal in either of those subjects unless it was based on a randomized controlled trial where there that is the gold standard causality was allowed but observational studies you could say there was an association something was a risk factor you could not use the word causal in fact up to quite a few years ago the leading many of the leading journals in statistics would not publish paper that used counterfactuals counterfactuals are the outcome you uh, you have um, your observed outcome, but the counterfactuals are the outcome you would have had if possibly contrary to fact, you were forced to take treatment. And, and the second one, counterfactual, the outcome you would have had if possibly contrary to fact, you were forced to not take treatment. Of those two, you only get to see one, the one corresponding to the treatment you did indeed take. You get to see that counterfactual becomes factual. That's the basis of, um, of almost all research on causal inference now. Just a few years ago, not many, you couldn't even publish in these journals. Like there was an editor at Biometrica, which is a leading statistical journal, who refused to even look at any paper that had counterfactuals. Times have greatly changed if you look at papers now. Uh, the other thing, how did it come? Uh, the internet obviously makes um, communication, understanding, collaboration across disciplines easy in a way that never was. And the other big innovation have been causal graphs that may that have this um, may, um, which I'm going to discuss a lot more. That make non-technical users like epidemiologists, people who can't manipulate complicated. Um, probability expressions. It made them able to participate in sophisticated causal, re sophisticated causal reasoning right on the level of experts because these graphs turn mathematical, complicated mathematical problems in just uh, to a problem of path tracing on the graphs. Other drivers were the desire for individualized treatment regimes in medicine. So, you know, 
people come into a even a randomized trial with many baseline covariates, you know, their height, their weight, their age, their liver function tests, their renal function tests. And what's the and two treatments are being compared, which is the best treatment for a given patient, may well depend on those pretreatment covariates. And causal inference methods have um, are used to try to work out which treatment is best for a given individual. And another driving factor was the tech companies realizing to optimize their profits and their competitiveness, uh, they had to figure out what the uh, effective interventions rather than just predictions. That is, if they're gonna change their web page, that's an intervention. Um, and we're in a new world where the web page is different. And the issue is how we, they have to know how much money they think they're going to make by doing that. And that's different. Uh, that's a very, that's a causal question rather than a prediction question and uses uh, different methods of design and analysis. Another issue with huge data sets that we now have um, because of technology and the internet leading to what's called data-driven science rather than hypothesis-driven science. Um, the fact that uh, the, the latter, I mean, having the last point, data-driven science has made real scientists, i.e. lab scientists, pay attention um, to causality. They need causal methods to find those causal SNPs, the, um, at which alleles um, genes are uh, uh, contribute to various human diseases. So um, uh, prior to these big data sets, um, the, uh, these, such people weren't interested in um, the statistics of causal inference. They, they just were satisfied with their own experiments. That's not enough anymore. Okay. And that's been interesting because when they needed help from statisticians with these huge data sets to figure out, you know, if I have 20,000 genes measured in my data set, how am I going to figure out which one is responsible for, um, for um, the outcome I'm interested in, for which causes or you know, which contributes to heart disease? So statisticians who would once heap scorn on us who were doing causal inference. And believe me, there were many, you know, and they know who they are, um, suddenly or blithely doing causal search explicitly or more often implicitly. Uh, I'll explain, they're doing it implicitly whenever they use the lasso. Causal search is trying, you have a very complicated system with 20,000 genes. Uh, the way genes cause a disease or gene networks, this gene turns on that gene, which inhibits that gene, that turns on that gene, and that gene affects th this biological function, and that causes the disease. <laughs> um, and since there are 20,000 genes, and who knows how many different networks, because you, you can start, you could have many per permutations, it's an overwhelming problem that um, you need computers and artificial intelligence, machine learning to deal with and finding, trying to discover from data, the actual causal structures, what we call causal search. So one of the first ways people did it was the last. So they put in 20,000 genes in a regression, regress a, uh, a disease, you know, do you have this disease? Use logistic regression or something. Use the lasso with 20,000 um, genes and um, all these uh, statisticians, it became the hottest thing in statistics. The statisticians used to make fun, scorned us doing causal inference were suddenly doing this, but they didn't recognize that the sparsity assumption needed for the lasso, that is only a few genes were gonna predict the outcome and the rest <clears throat> were gonna have coefficients essentially zero. That's the assumption that makes the lasso work is actually a causal assumption. And indeed, it is much stronger than any causal assumption I ever made when the same people were making fun of me for trying to do causality. That is, I've been overtaken by my previous detractors as they're doing causal search um, under huge assumptions that they don't realize often they're making, 
Um, and for me, causal search in a certain sense, I'll just describe, remains scientifically a bridge too far. That is, they've leapfrogged over me in how wild the assumptions are willing to make. Um, I, I, in a sense, I don't quite mean that anymore because the meaning of causal search has changed since the um, flame wars of the 90s. That's a joke. Um, you, uh, you all can look at these names and we can talk about that later. But we used to have some contentious paper about uh, papers about was causal search really um, possible? Um, we're all friends. They weren't really contentious. It wasn't a flame war. Okay, so in the 90s, during the flame wars, the questions are, it was sort of before big genetics. The questions were, are we going to use causal discovery to say, let's say alcohol prevents lung disease? Um, are we going to take just empirical data without any causal assumption, without any subject matter, substantive assumptions about what we know about biology, just put it in a computer and say, oh, well, the data says alcohol prevents lung disease. And um, under certain mathematical and philosophical theories, you, they are, uh, people can argue that might be possible, but to, um, to me, it, I didn't believe it for reasons you can ask me about that I'm not gonna go into right now. But causal discovery since the 2010s has been used for, is used very differently. Most of it, much of it, and most of the papers are about these big genomic data sets um, that I was discussing earlier. And from the point of, the, the point of view of um, from the 2010, causal discovery from the biologist's point of view, i.e. the real scientists who are using the discoveries, they're just, even though there's all this complicated causal thinking about it, they're really just to the biologist, another black box, all these fancy causal discovery methods. And they're directly competing with many other black boxes because many, almost, even people who aren't experts in causality have many ways that they claim to algorithms to find out which genes are important for which disease. Um, and so uh, the biologists and they, so the two groups, those using fancy causal methods and the others using whatever they like to use uh, would, uh, would get their results and make suggestions to biologists about what they thought they would, were doing. And the biologists would then do a real experiment to see if, um, those conjectures that came out of these analyses were true. And all the biologists cared about is who giving better suggestions. So if this causal discovery methods really work, then the biologists will turn to them and will learn that people can do causal discovery. Because unlike does alcohol prevent lung disease, the biologists go and do real randomized, effectively experiments. And so they, if you make a suggestion based on your causal um, search algorithm that um, gene A causes disease B, they can actually in certain ways go and check that. While we can't do randomized trials of alcohol and lung disease in any simple way. And so the problem in the 90s is people wanted to make big public suggested, I didn't say they were, you might be able to make big public health decisions um, about various exposures without a randomized trial by using causal discovery. I think no one has that right now kind of hubris anymore. And they just think they're gonna make suggestions um, to be confirmed their hypotheses from their analysis and experiment. Um, so Gary King is a well-known professor at Harvard said, 15 years ago that, or maybe more, more has been learned about causal instruments in the last 20 years. So that makes it 35 years. And in the preceding 2000, that's certainly the case. Nonetheless, percolation into practice can be slow, perhaps until the old guard moves on. That is, as people know, yesterday's innovators can become today's curmudgeons who stand in the way of progress because they won't accept the new ways of doing things. And in honor of that and myself getting older and becoming a curmudgeon, I actually have introduced a sub-branch of statistics called the curmudgeon theory of statistics, which you've 
uh, welcome to read about I'm not going to discuss it anymore here. Okay. Um, so, um, a little about what things looked like back then. So one of the <coughs> advantages of having um, um, uh, older um, people in the field, people who were there at the start, like myself and Don Rubin, Judith Pearl, um, one moment. <coughs> the reason I took a swig out of a bottle rather than that cup is, as I said, the graphs Thomas Richardson and I are going to invent it and we're going to show you later are called swigs. So that was just to remind you of their names. All right. And um, so in 1984, in um, statistics, medicine, epidemiology, all was regression. I, you wanted to know if a treatment had an effect on the outcome, you'd put the treatment in the model, and you, but you wanted to be sure it was causation, not, a cause, not um, correlation. So you'd put confounders, things you thought might be common causes of treatment in the outcome as well in the regression model. And hopefully those control confounding. And so therefore the coefficient in front of treatment would have a causal interpretation. This was well and good, except um, uh, when I, people came to time varying exposures, it didn't work. Regression, all, regression is biased with time varying exposures. Whenever time dependent confounders for later treatment are affected by earlier treatment. Um, so let me give you an example. Um, uh, in medicine, um, treatment by indications example. So there are um, antiretroviral, you want, we, uh, people want to know from observational data whether various antiretroviral drugs um, uh, slowed, the prevent, uh, slowed time to AIDS or death in people who are infected with the HIV virus. And for that, the biggest confounder at the time was what was called CD4 count. It's just the count of a certain immune cell that's killed by the virus. So the issue was um, how to get a, find the causal effect of the treatment. And here was the problem. People would start the treatment and stop it and, you know, based on their doctor's recommendations at various um, times during the study. And all these, and whenever they came to the doctors, they also measured their CD4 count, the confounder. Well, the problem was, is you, if you leave CD4 count out of the model, that's a problem because the reason the doctors, let's say we're in week 20 of the study, the reason the doctors start your treatment or return you to treatment in week 20 is, uh, because your CD4 count is low. So they know the virus is killing your cells. They want to stop it and they put in the antiretroviral. So, and CD4 count also predicts uh, AIDS because it's AIDS is the disease you get from having no immune um, immunity because all your CD4 cells have been killed by the virus. So um, that means that CD4 count is a classic confounder for later treatment. That is, CD4 count causes the doctors to give the treatment, it's low, and also predicts the outcome. So if you don't adjust for it, the association between later treatment and AIDS uh, is not causation. It's confounded by CD4 count. On the other hand, the reason, now let's look at earlier treatment. Suppose the way earlier treatment works is earlier treatment, which is true. Let's say treatment starting on day, people start getting treated on day zero, raises your CD4 count. That is, it kills the virus. So the virus is no longer killing the CD4 cells. Your bone marrow makes more CD4 cells. And um, therefore, you do better. So the causal pathway goes treatment, early treatment through CD4 cells to no AIDS. 
So if you, if you adjust for CD4 cells to get rid of the confounding for later treatment, you've just blocked the causal pathway from earlier treatment to, um, to AIDS so that the coefficient for earlier treatment may not really affect, uh, uh, represent the total effect, how good the drug is, because its effect is through CD4 count, but you're only comparing people with the same CD4 count at day 20, uh, because you need to stratify on CD4 count at day 20, because it's a confounder for treatment at day 30. So for that, you get the wrong answer, whether you um, adjust or don't adjust for these time varying confounders, CD4 count for a time varying exposure, uh, antiretroviral therapy. So um, uh, that's what I got interested in. And the methods that have been developed um, based on what's called the G formula, marginal structural models, stru structural nested models are not regression methods. They're very different kinds of analysis that, that um, in these fields had not been um, uh, um, seen before. Okay, so people started, I and other people started using them. And um, this was the time you weren't even allowed to use the word causality. And the only reason to use these fancy models is for causal reasons, because uh, simple adjustment doesn't work. And so in those days, um, I got blistering responses. I basically, except for luck here or there, couldn't publish for 10 years in, um, uh, in um, leading, let's say, statistical journals or medical journals. Um, so what are the critiques back in the old days before life was good and everyone accepted causal inference? Well, you'd hear, well, no one understands these methods. So I had not got, gone to graduate school, so I didn't have a mentor. So I was just a strange person recommending strange methods that reviewers had never seen. So I would get rejected over and over again. What kind of reviews I would get? I would get reviews like David Cox, his famous uh, statistician, um, said it could not be done. I, this kind of causal reasoning. Um, he didn't say that. I mean, he didn't say it could be done because he didn't know about it, but, he just, but they just said, he said it, they used authority to say that. And uh, they would, and then there's the issue, counterfactuals are unscientific. I already mentioned that certain journals want to allow them. And then my favorite is I got a bunch of rejections because the methods are too computationally complex. Let me tell you what that computational complexity was. So this was just about you know, a few years after the first PCs were introduced um, in the early to mid eighties. And the computations would be like, I'd have hmm, 5,000 two by two tables. And I had to test that the odds ratio in all of them was zero, like using a mantel hensel test. And that was considered too computationally complex. So these papers shouldn't be published. Compare that to your standard um, uh, deep neural network, and you'll see how silly that was. Um, what other things people would say were, we were just fine without these methods. We usually get the same answer and the new methods are harder to implement. Well, even were that true, which it's not, understanding the correct way to think about the relationship of causation to empirical data is valuable in itself. Again, the reason causal DAG, that's the reason causal DAGs caught on because they've allowed people to learn how to reason about the relationship between causation and empirical data. They didn't exist back in the days I'm talking about here, causal DAG. It's important to find, so therefore what was really important for us as innovators was to find areas of medicine where the new methods agreed with the results of randomized clinical trials, because randomized clinical trials aren't, uh, there can't be confounding for those in general, if people follow their um, assigned treatment because treatment is assigned by the flip of a coin, which, may, which is therefore the cause of treatment, heads or tails, that determines treatment or not, but coins don't cause the outcome by themselves. So they're not confounders. So um, the methods I 
developed, which are sometimes called G methods. G stands for generalized treatment regimes, methods where I try to estimate the effect of different treatment strategies, um, became the standard in HIV um, epidemiology after Miguel Hernan and I showed that um, our methods agreed with uh, the results of randomized trials, um, but the standard methods did not because of this confounding by CD4 count. Uh, standard methods got the wrong answer whether you adjusted for CD4 count or did not. So that, um, okay. Then here are some of the other complaints. These methods are damaging the field. Um, so especially causal graphs often get attacked for this in statistics and in epidemiology. They take away time from learning study design, data collection, or other statistical methods. Graphs replace thinking. Graphs replace biologies because you can do causal reasoning by following links, uh, edges on the graph. Therefore, people using graphs are no longer scientists. And they, these same criti critical thinkers who didn't like graphs would say, what is important is to understand the mechanisms as if graphs, graphs aren't exactly the kind of uh, um, diagram you can, um, where it's easy to put mechanisms and theories about how they work on these diagrams. Um, <clears throat> so in fact, all these things they criticized, uh, there was no reason for it. The graphs just help people communicate about um, uh, uh, study design, data collection, confounding. Uh, they don't replace thinking. They don't replace biology. It is just, um, you know, protesting against something new. Um, another thing people used to argue is they cannot be applied to um, the studies like of human motivation, uh, states like blood pressure, obesity. Um, because uh, graph um, graphs, you try to think about what would be estimate what the effect or what you should compute to get the effect of, let's say, interventions on obesity or interventions on human motivation. And you just have this observational data. So what connects any intervention you might want to do to the data you're actually um, seeing? that because obesity doesn't change you have to do an intervention to change obesity right you have to you know tie up someone's stomach or put them on a diet or make them exercise or do liposuction so the point is is that it is harder to draw causal inferences about these kinds of uh, uh questions but it's not like but because it's harder is not the, that's a fact of the world it's not a fact of because graphs are these more complicated causal methods were introduced and um it's just a category mistake for people to suddenly start um, blaming new methods for these problems because they had the problems without the new methods and they had even more than the problems because even if uh, interventions on obesity and blood pressure had been well defined, as we've seen, their methods uh, would not work. So, um, so it was a tough time, and can still be a tough time, being in causal inference. Okay, um, I'm not going to go into that. So, um, the reason I have mandatory here is this is um, what uh, in my. Uh, early papers, this was the addendum to my first paper. This is how in 1987, I described what I was doing in writing this paper. And um, I, I, it still to me uh, agrees with what I think uh, so many years later, hopefully we've made some progress. And so, that, so, if, so anyway, I'm gonna go through it with you because I always do. So uh, the data from some longitudinal study, like the HIV study I was talking to you about, consists of a string of numbers. Just that each person, you have all their data, with, you know, what was collected on them each day. And so there are a series of empirical measurements, like at monthly intervals, their exposure treatment level, whether they're smokers, 
that's a confound that's a confounder. Um, they're exposed. Uh, but they were, I was an occupational health error. so I, uh, so I was doing um, uh, studies on um, factory workers over time, which you know did um, arsenic cause lung cancer, things like that, and arsenic a time dependent exposure, and leaving work is a time dependent confounder because you don't get arsenic exposure if you leave work. And if you leave work, you're often sick. So leaving work predicts the outcome. Um, so um, so uh, people take these strings of numbers, they put them in a computer, they do calculations, and then they end up with English sentences. For example, an investigator might say that the analysis provides strong evidence for a direct effect of arsenic on lung cancer mortality. Uh, not controlling for what that means is not through through a causal pathway that does not go through cigarette smoking. Now, at the time, this so this is what would happen. Every paper, there'd be some analysis, whatever method, and then some English sentence at the end, like this in epidemiology, where you were allowed to make causal, roughly causal statements, although they um, are statements that were interpreted causally. And these are the kind of causal statements. And so, um, uh, so my, what I want to do is uh, find an answer for what is, what, what should be the nature of the relationship between these English sentences and uh, expressing the investigators finally, final causal inference and the computer calculations performed on the string of numbers and had never really been clarified in these complicated studies. And since the numerical strings and computer algorithms are well-defined mathematical objects, it, it uh, was clear to me I would need to provide a formal mathematical definition for the English sentences expressing the investigators' causal inferences that agree with our formal intuitive understanding because I'm doing mathematical calculation. I have to have a formal theory of mathematical theory of causality to connect with the English, uh, to, to encode the English statements. Um, so what I, uh, so um, in A6, I introduced this counterfactual model um, called the finest fully randomized causal instructed tree graph, the FFRCISTG model, so acronym challenge. And the idea was to extend um, point treatment counterfactual models of Neyman and Rubin to longitudinal studies with all these time dependent pro problems, time varying treatments, time varying confounders that affected a later treatment, but were affected by earlier treatment mediators, those are intermediate variables, like the CD4 count was, you know, variables on the causal pathway from exposure, like CD4 count, uh, direct and indirect effects of exposure, and feedback of one cause on another, like CD4 causes later treatment, which causes later CD4. Um, and the model um, also allowed one to rigorously define um, uh, um, direct effects. And if I have time, I'm going to come back to this. Um, but I'm going to go on because I'm going to come back if I have time. Um, so, um, um, so back to causal graphs. So, so under that model, I um, proposed in 86 and under a model Perl um, proposed, which is called the non-parametric structural equation model with independent er error, something called a functional model. Um, both of them can be essentially represented by directed acyclic graphs, causal graphs, because the observed data distribution factorizes according to the causal DAG. Um, if you, uh, um, and I'll tell you more about that in a moment. These were introduced by Spiritus Glymores and Shines and generalized in advance by Pearl and his colleagues. Um, and the, as I said before, the great thing about causal graphs plus deseparation, this path tracing technology, turns a difficult mathematical problem into a simple one of graph topology. You can do, you can calculate all sorts of complicated independence, um, conditional independences from the graphs 
um, topology where the graph represents a statistical model um, that says, um, that basically says um, uh, each um, variable is um, independent, um, um, that each, vari each variable is independent of variables earlier than it, given its direct causes, its parents. We'll see that in a moment. So don't worry about the definition right now. So um, the use of direct acyclic graphs to encode causal relations dates to Sewell Wright. Um, but the problem were, was, as I explained earlier, I told you the people who worked in counterfactuals to causality and people using these graphs couldn't talk to each other. And that's still somewhat true. And to, um, and to do that, um, Thomas Richardson and I introduced these things called SWIGs that link counterfactuals and graphs so uh, people can talk, the two different schools can talk to one another. And in fact, these SWIGs are essentially a uh, graphical representation of the, in a certain sense, the entire FFRCISTG model is encoded in these SWIGs. So now anyone can, um, reason about this very complicated mathematical model by just looking at pictures. And I'll show you the easiest case right now. Okay, so here's what the problem was. Um, if you were a graphical person, a causal graph, um, a causal graph, this one, was supposed to re represent no confounding, no common causes of A and Y. And this graph represented a world in which U was a common cause of A and Y. And here U was an unmeasured variable. So in this world, association is not causation. In this world, association is causation. And so, <clears throat> so, uh, People in graphs know this represents no confounding, and this represents um, confounding, a common cause. It, so that the association between A and Y may not be all causal or may even go in the wrong direction from the actual causal effect of A on Y because of confounding by U. Okay, but how are we gonna link these? Well, let's go to a counterfactual person. A counterfactual person thinks no confounding is that people's treatment A is independent of their counterfactual Y had we forced people to have A equals zero. So that's what happens in a randomized trial. If you think of your counterfactual, the value of Y you would have had if you were never treated, think of that as encoded in your genes or something. So when you flip a coin that determines treatment, whether the the coin comes up heads or not, that is whether A is one or A is zero, you got treatment or didn't, is independent obviously of your genes. So treatments will be independent of your counterfactual and it will be treat in, independent of the counterfactual, uh, the variable Y when you force somebody to have zero and the counterfactual Y when you force somebody to have one. And confounding to someone who does counterfactuals is just A's not independent of y equals zero and not independent of y a equal one. So how are these two people gonna to talk to each other? I mean, it seems impossible because how can we connect it? Because the variables, the counterfactuals used to define no confounding and confounding um, uh, to a counterfactualist aren't even on the graphs. There's no way to talk about them. Okay, so how can we connect them? and so this is fun. I'm going to explain this. Thomas Richardson and I wrote a paper on SWIGs. We called it our Dropbox folder. We called um, uh, simple theory because it was so simple to show how to do this. Yet by the time we did all the details, the paper was 150 pages long and complicated. However, it is still a simple theory. And I'm going to explain most of the theory to you in the next minute, okay? But not all the bells and whistles. So you remember here was our causal graph of no confounding. That's in terms of the factuals. Now ask yourself, suppose I really 
you didn't do it because this is you have observational data. But suppose I had I intervened and forced everyone in the study to have treatment zero. Okay, so I'm going to give everyone treatment A equals zero. That's what this represents. Then what's in that hypothetical study? What's the Y you'll observe? It will for everybody. It will be the counterfactual Y corresponding to not getting treatment because you didn't give anyone treatment. So, but this variable A still exists. What is A? A is the very the decision you made in the observational study, whether to take treatment or not. So if I didn't force you to have A equals zero, you would have still made you would have still made that same decision. So the existence, whether you measure it or not, of the decision you would have made had I not intervened and forced you to take A equals zero still exists. There it is. But your Y A equals zero, all the causing of that is from uh, the thing I intervened on. And the intervened on variable is, a, is, a, is not random. So, and since the A no longer causes it's the A equals zero that's causing that. Your random A has nothing to do with what's causing Y. That is the, the A you would have chosen because you were forced to take A equals zero. It's now, you've split the node and it's sitting separate out here because it's no longer doing the causing as it was here because I've intervened. So in this counterfactual world, A is separated from Y A equals zero. There's no path between them. But on graphs, whenever there are two variables, they have no path between them. They are, that's the way we use graphs. That represents independence. So by going into the counterfactual world and looking what the data would look like in the counterfactual world, whether or not this guy was measured, I now can read off from the gra counterfactual graph, which we call the SWIG. Uh, it's the single world where I force everyone to have A equals zero we see that A is independent of Y equals zero. So we've just learned that this causal graph is equivalent to that counterfactual statement. And we've, that completely unifies the two groups. For example, if there was a U here, then in the counterfactual world, it would look like this, but there'd still be a variable U causing your outcome Y and your, the choice you would have made, but weren't allowed to make. And so uh, that's supposed to be a U. I have very, I have a tremor with arrows there and there. So now in that, if there was a U on the original graph, I now have a path A, U, Y equals zero. So I get that A is not independent of Y equals zero. So I get, so if this is the original graph. That's what we call a uh, conf uh, confounded graph we find out this is that it's confounded using the counterfactual um, uh, world viewpoint. So there, this completely um, unifies them. Um, let me see, I'm gonna go back to this. Um, okay, then I'm going to quickly go to the future and then I'm gonna come back to the interesting topics that I didn't get to yet so that at least I'll finish the talk and then because there are three or four topics I haven't gotten to. So I wanted, since I've talked to you about the past of causal inference and especially about the beginning because that's what you have most to learn about from me because I was there at the time. Um, uh, what, is, what are gonna be the big topics in causal inference in the future? Well, one of the biggest topics is called inter interference. What is interference? Interference, in most causal inference, we assume that the treatment I take affects my outcome, but the treatment um, that you take, somebody else, does not affect my outcome. If somebody else's treatment affects my outcome, we say that the, there's interference. The classic example of this is infectious disease like COVID, whether, uh, um, whether I get, let's say I don't get vaccinated, my outcome, whether I get COVID, depends not only on the fact that I'm not vaccinated, 
but depends on whether you were vaccinated because everybody else is vaccinated, but maybe there's herd immunity and I won't get it even though I'm not vaccinated, but if none of you were vaccinated, we'd all get it. So, um, so other people's treatment affects mine. And it used to be, well, it used to be thought that it was hard to make progress on this um, subject, but since then there's been huge progress in recent years. There are too many people and innovations to review. So here are just a few early papers uh, that I left out hundreds of people. So one of the uh, paper by Hudgens and Halloran that really started the counterfactual formulation of the questions. Uh, Peter Arno and his co-authors um, have written a number of early papers. Eric Chechen Chechen and Tyler Vanderweel wrote uh, an early paper, and as I said, many others. So um, interference turns out to uh, raise its head everywhere, not just in infectious disease epidemiology, but you know, in many, many other um, places. Um, and we have about sorry, ten minutes. Left 10 minutes? Okay. okay. Yep. Okay. Another thing is how to integrate another future problem is how to integrate machine learning with causal inference. This is a huge topic on Twitter. All know it's important. Few are sure what it means, but everyone's sure it's needed. Um, a natural place for this is uh, what I was talking about before, causality and genomics and other biological measurements, which are natural setting. They need AI because of the huge data sets. So, so data sets are available with CRISPR knockouts of all 20,000 genes individually. That'll be a cell with it's just this gene knocked out, another cell with this one knocked out and so forth. And so we have to find, as I said, that's this causal search problem. We wanna reconstruct the genetic networks to figure out how these various genes cause disease. Or, um, or influence other diseases. That's the genetic, uh, other genes. Uh, what's the genetic network leading finally to the disease? And so there's, some, I'm just, you know, doing shout outs for some interesting new ideas and uh, recent ones in these areas. So um, there's a recent paper about invariance of causal effects and heterogeneous backgrounds. Heterogeneous backgrounds in this case means the cell this, this, I know this gene was knocked out, this cell, I know this gene was knocked out. So I have heterogeneous causal um, settings. Um, and uh, um, there's this paper by uh, Peters Pullman and Meinhausen suggesting a new approach to this, but it's got a, it's got a long ways to go before it uh, wins the black box competition that I was discussing earlier on who helps biologists more. Um, other ideas that are quite are using deep neural networks. Let's say um, this is some things Carolyn Uller and other people have been doing, where um, you use uh, auto encoders that basically take your data, put it in some well, not, some latent space based on something going on in that auto encoder, and that latent space represents trying to you're trying to find latent structure in your data uh, in an unsupervised way. And that's what these autoencoders are supposed to do. And then once you, once you have this uh, recoding of the variables in this latent space made up by your autoencoders, that hopefully find some structure, you apply causal methods to those variables, not to the original ones, because that space um, that new space hopefully has a much simpler and more direct causal structure. You've got the important variables there. Um, so that's um, another big project for the future. Um, and another one is we now have big data sets um, like all of uh, Medicare data. Um, uh, on millions and millions of people with hundreds of thousands of variables in each person. But there's all, if we wanna do causal inference with them, there's always gonna be unmeasured confounding because the data is not collected for research purposes. So no, no one carefully tried to collect data on all the confounders. So you have to adjust for unmeasured confounding. This is not like adjusting for CD4 count where they used to do it wrong. And now we can do it right using these new causal methods 
a CD4 count was measured. But what do you do if these things are unmeasured? Well, that's clearly impossible without very, very strong assumptions, stronger than the ones needed when we do measure them. So there've been many proposals, some carefully thought through and probably creative, others not. So there's an embarrassment of riches of proposals out there. Many of these by computer scientists, statisticians, um, all sorts of people. Um, and it's hard to tell them apart. So I think, and to know which assumptions are the best. And so rather than just algorithms, I think it's important to have some actual understanding what the assumption, what are the assumptions, what they mean. And for this, my winner of interesting suggestions is this new area of proximal inference started by Eric Chechen Chechen and, and Miao Wang that is really tell, making quite precise what the relationship of the unmeasured confounders is to the rest of the measured data and showing exactly the conditions under which you could draw um, causal inferences even in the uh, even with unmeasured confounders if you have appropriate other variables which they call proxy variables you can read about it um, okay let's see do i have any time left all right well let's see what i i'll tell you what i you can ask me questions i'll tell you what i didn't get to I didn't, I didn't get to double robustness and why it exists in causal inference. I didn't get to um, direct effects and how direct the history of direct effects. Um, I didn't get to describing the difference between the G formula, marginal structural models and structural nested models. So those are the areas um, I have slides on I haven't gotten to. So I'll take questions now, either about what I said or um, you can ask me questions about those. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, so anyone on Zoom, if you'd like to ask a question, you can unmute yourself. If you're on YouTube, you can write your question in the chat. Uh, I have a question. Um, I, I thought it was interesting uh, earlier, you talked about how Lasso was making sort of a causal assumption. And I, I just kind of wanted to maybe push back and see what your response is. If, if, they, if someone might say, well, I'm not making a causal assumption. I'm just assuming that these things, you know, just have a, a zero coefficient in the model and, um, we're, we're just right. right. So, okay. So yeah, I, I didn't have time to really explain. So let me explain what I mean. So um, you have to, so the assumption that you, for the lasso to find structure in general, things have to be sparse. I mean, okay. The question is from a causal inference, why should a regression be sparse? Why should there only be a few um, big factors. And you're going to say to me, well, because only a few things out of all these, you know, genes, let's say, cause the outcome. And I say, well, that I agree with. But what if there's confounding? What if there are common causes? What if the, um, uh, there are common, unmeasured common causes of, you know, um, the outcome and Many of the variables, as there usually are, I mean, there are many common causes in the world um, of many of the variables, then it turns out you'll get confounding and you'll have things, you can have big coefficients for non causal things. For causal things, you can have small coefficients because their causal stuff's been balanced out by confounding. So the belief that you're going to find sparse things to begin with is this belief that. I have no confounding essentially for any of the, let's say 10 variables, which I don't know which ones they are that are causal. Well, I was never making, you know, I would only do that usually when I do my stuff, if I actually have a good biological and scientific reason, these are the confounders I need to know because, because a confounder has to be associated with the treatment and the outcome and doctors. This is the data doctors use to decide the treatment. So if I collect that data, I'll have no confounding. There's no thinking like that going on. They just throw them all in there. So 
Um, and in fact, people who are, did a lot of this work, let's take Peter Pullman, who had started on the lasso, you know, he came to totally realize this and went into more formal kinds of justified causal discovery where you um, don't make assumptions that there are no confounders, but you try to discover them from the data using this other assumption called faithfulness, which I'm not going to get into, but basically it says any independence you see in the data is for some causal reason. I mean, and another point with the lasso is often when you get the lasso results, okay, you find six variables. You don't know what's really sparse. That's what the lasso just gave you. You've got to hope it was sparse, but you have no reason to believe it was sparse if there may be confounding, and you have no reason to believe there's not confounding. So if you actually want to deal with the causal question, you have to think there may be confounding and think of ways to do it starting from there, even unmeasured confounding. And that's this whole area of formal area of causal discovery, which I don't know if it works, but at least it's mathematically rigorous and we know what people are doing, what assumptions they're making. That's not what the people who are doing the lasso and thinking they were discovering things were doing. Thank you, that's really interesting. Um, so we have another question from YouTube uh, asking for some suggestions on introductory papers or, or maybe a survey or, or a book or something. Well, uh, um, Miguel Hernan, so I don't know, I'll plug my own book because it's, if you like my talk, that's how I think. Um, there's Miguel and Hernan and I have a book called, I think, Causal Inference or something, What If? It's on the web. Uh, it was supposed to be published 10 years ago, but one of the authors is unreliable and hasn't finished his work, but it's on the web. And it will be published very soon, as I've been saying for 10 years. Um, yeah, so causal inference, what if, look up Miguel Hernan, because um, he keeps it on his website. Great, thank you. Uh, maybe we have time for one more question. Does anyone else have a question? Well, if I may, uh, Jim, thank you so much. This is an excellent talk. Uh, maybe you should come back again, give us a few more, a few, lots of things remaining that yeah, I haven't talked yet. Uh, yeah. It's really exciting. I'd be glad to. So. Thank you so much. It's great. Okay. Super. Okay. Bye bye. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> Um, uh, to all of our attendees, uh, this seminar series will continue next week. We're going to have two seminars. Uh, Professor Judea Pearl will be speaking at 1.30, and Professor Elias Barenboim will be speaking at 2.30. Uh, so I hope uh, to see you all again next week, and thanks for coming. All right. Thanks, Jim. It's wonderful.